Sure, we'll start. And then, um, welcome once again. And then I would like to introduce the topic, uh, mental health and psychosocial support being led by Dr. Dorothy Doe. And I would warmly like to welcome her. Please welcome her with a nice round of applause. <laughs> Um, thanks so much. It's great to be in person. This is the first in-person meeting I've been to since COVID, and it's it's truly, it is amazing. Um, sure, thanks. Miguel, what an amazing speech. I was so inspired, so thank you for the youth who have really, I think, lifted our spirits today. Um, and the Energizer, I totally lost. <laughs> I, I, I get no prize for that. My reflexes are not not working so well. Um, but I'm here to talk today about mental health. Um, I'll get my, myself sorted here. Um, so I wanted to, to steal from the, the topic of the World Suicide Prevention Day, um, which is creating hope through action. And we all know that adolescent health and well-being are critical to our collective future. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought heightened attention to the striking adolescent mental health crisis that we're facing, particularly among the most vulnerable adolescents that are high risk for acquiring or are already living with HIV. Um, I wanted to go through a few objectives, so we can go to the next slide, please. First, we're going to summarize the data on adolescents, adolescent mental health, and how it relates to adolescent HIV outcomes. Um, discuss why adolescence is such a critical and vulnerable time for both mental health challenges and poor HIV outcomes. And understand this no-do gap that we are facing in integrating adolescent mental health interventions into HIV care and some possible solutions that, that we have. Um, so first, a little bit about the data. So we're facing a youth bulge, as you've heard. Um, but this you know, could be considered a great thing after we've heard this energizing speech um, and all that this next generation are going to do for us. But currently, we're living, um, there are more adolescents living today than at any other point in history. Um, about a quarter of all people living are young people, and about nine out of 10 are living in a low middle income setting. Um, and if we look at HIV, um, there are approximately 4 million youth living around the world with HIV. As we've heard, 4,000 new infections every week, about 1,600 is the, the older report every day, almost one per minute. And about nine out of 10 adolescents who live with HIV live, live here, right in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as we heard today, six out of seven girls um, in the age range of 15 to 19. So we've got to do better. Um, the sustainable development goals that we heard, number three, the good health and well-being, um, these were released in 2015. And goal number three importantly identifies both mental health and HIV as specific targets to be reached by 2030. But despite the focus of these interlinked syndemics, investments in adolescent mental health and integration into HIV prevention and care services are really severely lacking. Um, so what, where are we currently? Um, the State of the World's Children, published by UNICEF in 2021, really presents a, a highly concerning picture. Suicide ranks as the third and fourth overall cause for girls, number three, and for boys, number four. Um, and every minute, every 11 minutes, um, someone commits suicide in this age range. You know, this is a healthy population. They've got their whole world ahead of them, um, and, and we're really missing the ball here. One in seven adolescents has a mental disorder. That's about 15%, 14, 15%. And then for those adolescents living with HIV, it's much higher, um, estimated more like 25 to 50%. Uh, this slide really shows that anxiety and depression make up the majority of these disorders for this age group. And we know that half of all mental health disorders present by the age of 14 years of age. But the, more, the majority by far go unrecognized 
and they go untreated. And this is especially true in low income settings. So why is adolescence such a vulnerable development, developmental um, time? Well, advancements in neuroscience have really shown us that adolescence is both a time of profound human potential, but also acute vulnerability. And this compendium of the adolescent brain put forth by UNICEF really helps explain why adolescence is such a critical and vulnerable time. It is marked by dramatic hormonal and physical changes, as well as tremendous and dynamic brain development. And these might in part explain why adolescents have a tendency, as we all know and have all been there, for risk taking, for substance use, um, for higher risk sex, and for emergence of mental health disease. Um, again, this is um, a slide, it's a wonderful figure put forth from Patel et al. In a, in a Lancet commission, and it really shows the interplay of biologic, social determinants, and phenotypes. Our focus here is in the rectangle around adolescence. Um, as we mentioned, there's growing understanding of how experience and the social environment combine with genetics to shape the adolescent brain and the capabilities an individual takes that they take forward to, with them into their adult life. Peer networks and social connections become priorities at this stage, and they can really strongly influence decision making. We know that adverse childhood experiences, such as physical and emotional abuse, chronic neglect and violence, all of these, which we know were really increased during COVID-19, can really contribute to an environment of toxic stress and really um, make this a real critical challenge for, for adolescents to get through. Adolescents living with HIV have the added burden of navigating these peer and romantic relationships while they live with a stigmatized and sexually transmittable infection. And we also know that finding out this diagnosis, finding out that you live with HIV is often also very traumatic. And so exposure to increasing number of ACEs is strongly associated with sexual risk taking, with substance use, as well as interpersonal and self-directed violence. Um, so, what is the added impact that HIV might have for some adolescents? Well, this is um, some work that we did, qualitative interviews in Tanzania. And this is a young woman who said, the only thing I would like to change about myself is the disease that I have. If I could, I would want to be HIV negative. So I can get married, I can have a baby, and I can be happy. And so for her, HIV was traumatic. It prevented her from accepting herself. It prevented her from seeing a future full of hope or possibility. And if you don't have hope for the future, then why are you gonna take your medicine? Why are you gonna bother? And so this is what we were really seeing. And this is um, what sort of brought me into this mental health space as an infectious diseases physician. And so I think the first step is raising awareness and, and mental health literacy. And the definition for adolescent mental health put forth by the WHO is mental health is a positive sense of identity, the ability to manage thoughts, emotions, and to build social relationships, and the aptitude to learn and to acquire an education that enables full and active participation in society. Good mental health is more than the absence of disease. And I think that's a really critical point. Um, too often, mental health is considered as an extreme. It's critically important that we shift this lens and that we conceptualize mental wellness and mental challenges on a spectrum. For the majority, if mental health challenges are recognized early and effective intervention is received, skills and awareness building around positive coping strategies can really reduce the level of distress and help you maintain wellness. We have effective interventions for this, and our colleagues in neuroscience have shown us how this can work. But these interventions are not reaching adolescents that need them, and I think we've heard this. So why? Adolescence, again, is a critical phase for achieving human potential, and the consequences of not addressing adolescent mental health extend far into adulthood. They limit opportunities to leave fulfilling lives as adults, and they potentially affect future generations. So in the State of the World's Children in 2021, data were presented, and I think this is, you know, is a real focus on mental health. 
Um, Evidence-based interventions have clearly demonstrated efficacy to improve mental health with psychotherapy, with medication, or a combination. There's toolkits like CETA, or the Common Elements Treatment Approach. There's the WHO MH GAP for Community Toolkit. These are all accessible, they can be adapted, and they can be used in a variety of contexts, but there must be leadership behind this. There has to be investment. We have to quantify the problem, we have to harmonize measurements, and we have to implement effective interventions. Um, adolescent mental health is increasingly realized as a contributor to HIV outcomes and overall well-being for adolescents at risk of living with HIV but significant gaps in integrating adolescent mental health into HIV prevention and treatment research and care really persist. And this is an outstanding article by Lucy Kluver and colleagues that underscores this ongoing lack of investment to integrate adolescent mental health into HIV programs. And they state complacency cannot persist. There's substantial need, but youth living with HIV have incredible potential to live healthy and happy lives. We have solutions, but they have to be integrated into care and be, be available to those who really need them. So in an invited article for the AHESA network, we unpacked this no-do gap. Um, knowing adolescent mental health is critical to better outcomes, yet it's rarely being integrated. We surveyed men members of the AHESA Alliance to identify barriers, and, and these are some that were, were largely listed. So, Lack of skills and training in um, our local healthcare system, lack of supervision for, for lay counselors, lack of treatment and referral pathways, needing validated screening tools, not having great mental health literacy or awareness, lack of adolescent friendly spaces and services, and funding were all listed as, as barriers. And so we use the implementation science research framework, um, EPIS, uh, to try to discuss some potential solutions around these barriers and um, especially focusing for this talk, we'll talk about innovation factors around the lay or the peer counselors that can help relieve some of the barriers around a lack of skilled healthcare workers um, or those, you know, psych not having a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you can still do a lot um, with, with some pretty basic tools. And so as we've heard, um, nothing about us without us, right? I think we all in this room definitely believe in this. And so we um, use this three lens approach to youth participation. So it's critically important that, that we're not just, um, have, we're just not you're working for youth just as beneficiaries, but we're engaging them as partners. So they're at the table with us, as we've heard, and that we're supporting youth as leaders. In a survey reported from um, the State of the World's Children and UNICEF, there was a survey done, um, and 83% of youth said they believe it's better to address mental health issues by sharing experiences with other people and seeking support rather than going it alone. And I think all too often the youth are going at it alone, and they don't feel like there is a place for them, and we need to create that space. We need to create those places. So in the last two minutes, I just want to prevent, present some exciting interventions that do have evidence and that are ripe for adaptation and scale. It's not intended to be comprehensive, but rather to underscore that work is being done in this space, that tools do exist, and we just need to get them out there to those who need them. So Let's Talk is a group-based intervention that promotes mental wellness and addresses distress for HIV prevention among at-risk adolescents and their caregivers. This is in South Africa. There's Amara. So this was a project started in the United States and through a patch grant was adapted for South Africa. And it has some really great findings um, that show some improvement in mental health as well as HIV outcomes for prevention. Um, VUCA was um, in South Africa, so it's a family-based psychosocial intervention for 10 to 14-year-olds. It started also in the U.S. as CHAMP+, Plus, but it's been now adapted and piloted in South Africa and also in Thailand, and it offers lots of promising results um, using sort of a cartoon-based platform. As it sounds like we'll hear uh, Jivendari, I don't think I say it correctly, so I'll look forward for the presenters to pronounce their amazing project. 
um, but the CATS supporters, and I think they've partnered with Friendship Bench and have some, some really great findings as well. And then finally, not finally, but um, Stavsia Vijana, so this is um, a project that we put together in Tanzania with youth. They named the project The Voice of Youth. It's 10 sessions, um, group-based sessions. Two of them are jointly held with caregivers and two are individual sessions. And it's really to promote positive coping, resilience, and to improve HIV outcomes. We have some good results here and we're scaling up across Tanzania. And then Impact 2016. So this is um, an exciting study unique to, to these listed. This one is pri the primary outcome is based on mental health. So this is really to target those who are having self-reported mental distress and trying to see if this intervention can really help first with mental health and then secondary if that improves HIV outcomes. And this will be rolled out in four countries and eight sites. And so just to wrap it up, um, this was a great correspondence in The Lancet, and this was in response to an, a more adult-based intervention around mental health. And I loved it. It's an Italian group working in Mozambique, and their final paragraph, which I think is so true, says, our call is directed to the scientific, academic, and policy-making communities. Let us not forget the mental health needs of this adolescent population. And so just to end on a high note, to me, this picture signifies resilience. And we trained up 25 new group leaders in Tanzania in an intensive two-week training. Um, we've been continuing to train on Satya Vijana for them for almost a year. You know, it takes time for youth to really get um, the skill set and understanding. So this is a, a, an investment. It's a process in both time, especially, and some money. Um, but they had some fun time at the Mataruni Waterfalls in Tanzania. And just to say, investing in mental health promotion, prevention, and treatment through an integrated HIV care model is an investment that supports adolescents not only to thrive in their future, but it can have long-lasting impact on generations to come. Complacency cannot persist. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions if we're doing it now or if we're going to wait. Okay. But thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.